Bob Seeley. Speaker, um, by way of disclosure, um, I had the privilege to serve in a modest way in the Afghan and Iraq campaigns, and I, rem I remain a reservist soldier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thank very much the Honourable, Right Honourable Gentleman for Gedley for bringing this debate, and it's a pleasure to follow uh, the Honourable Member for Western Bartonshire. Um, in, in this brief speech, I, I, I would like to see defence uh, and talk about defence in the broader sense of the word. I think the security of our nation rests on many things, not just how many ships or tanks we have. And I think at times we can be a little fixated about so-called heavy metal warfare, ships, planes, tanks, etc. Physical defence is important, but it should not be seen in isolation. Um, and I think today I'd like to talk about security and defence in the round. Having said that, it is quite clear that we are significantly under-resourced and underfunded. And what concerns me most of all in terms of government department is that the Treasury seems to fail to understand that the point of having an armed force is not to use it. Yep. The Treasury seems to think that if an armed force isn't being used, it can be cut. That is an incredibly foolish thing to think. It encourages our generals to look for wars to justify the existence of the armed forces, and starting wars and being politically or economically unwilling to finish them, and there is some truth there as regards to Iraq, is at best bad strategy and potentially disastrous for this nation. Um, I'd like to talk about strategy and whether actually we have one how we can improve coherence in policy making, and just a few suggestions for parliamentary committees, building on some of the excellent things said by my colleagues on this side and that side of the House as well. First on strategy, I think it is ironic that we have so many think tanks in this country, um, but we seem to lack one sometimes in our national strategy. And I fear we are losing the capacity and confidence to act without clinging on to the coattails of the EU or the United States. Indeed, the United States, despite its many great benefits as an ally, has in some ways helped that problem. The great Oxford historian Sir Hugh Strawn argues that a power which possesses overwhelming force has little need of strategy because it has so much power. And I think that has resulted in thoughtlessness definitely in Iraq and maybe to a lesser extent in Afghanistan. And we have been somewhat corrupted by that thought as well because our strategy seems to be in the past 20 years to cobble together just enough kit to take part at a meaningful level in a US-led coalition so we can have a political voice at the top table. That strategy is now under pressure, Madam Deputy Speaker. First, the US has been slowly disengaging, regardless of what one thinks of the, uh, President Trump. The US has been disengaging slowly from Europe for the last three presidencies, and the Russians are now a threat with what they call contemporary military conflict, both military tools and non-military tools as well. Please, thank you. I do thank him for giving away. It's just one thing that's been worrying me a great deal. A number of people have cited Russia as a growing threat. But it would be dangerous to ignore the threat from the South. And the threat from the South still exists. So is it not time that we stopped focusing simply on the threat from the East, but also recognise that threats from the South has not gone away? Good point. The reason I talk about the threat from the East is I'd like to bring it in a bit later. Also, I'm trying to finish a thesis on contemporary Russian warfare. So, but you're right. In many ways, non-conventional warfare threat, migration, chaos, this is represented in our southern flank, and, and uh, the Honourable Lady makes a very valid point. Thank you. Post-Brexit, I think it is critical for our nation that we have a powerful security and defence policy, one that projects our identity, our values, our brand, if you like, but also provides a balanced and comprehensive security. And part of that is that to, re to remain pow a powerful player on the world stage across the spectrum of effects. I do think we're trying to be more holistic, and the uh, Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre in Shrivenham, and I've done a little, bit a little bit of work with them over the years, has done some important work looking at national strategy in many of the JDP documents that they have written. Now, according to them, our national strategy rests on political, military and economic power. I do, however, wonder if that is not quite subtle enough for today's world. Really, in defence, one needs to be thinking about humanitarian power, governmental power, cyber capability, cultural, linguistic, informational, public outreach. All these tools are critical because the wars and the conflicts of the past 30 years, including those we have been engaged in, show that populations have become critical information and psychological targets. And if you look at Russian doctrine, that's the, 
the three Russian doctrines, military doctrines since 1999, two foreign policy concepts, the national security concept and their information security concept, they all put the integration of military and non-military effects aimed at civilian populations as a critical characteristic of modern warfare, and indeed we see that in Ukraine and Eastern Europe and elsewhere. Um, historically, the tools of grand strategy have been held at a national level. Military force was one element of that defensive strategy. And I think we need nowadays, especially with Brexit, we have an opportunity to rethink our national strategic culture to understand how we can use the past or our experiences of strategic culture to understand the future. Basil Little Hart, perhaps our greatest military theorist ever, and I'm sure that some of the right honourable friends on this side of the House will know him well, said that we were champions of the indirect strategy. Mm. Powerful navy, a small standing army, using money to encourage others to fight, using our alliances and setting examples by our behaviour. And we probably need to return to that more. I'll give you an example, if I may, just in Eastern Europe with the Russian threat in Ukraine. We have parked some soldiers and some kit and about four planes, which is probably half the RAF these days, in the Baltic republics. Russia has used force in Ukraine and is bellicose against the, uh, the Baltic republics, and it's right we put that kit there. But the most powerful threat to Ukraine is not the military threat necessarily, but it is the political and informational war, the co-option and the corruption of its political leadership, the trashing of that nation's ability and confidence and statehood. The weapon here, our key weapon, is not the planes, it is not the troops, as important as they are, but it is our ability to work with the Canadians, with the Americans, with the Germans, with the EU, to provide a Marshall package for Ukraine, significant sums of money. We spend $13 billion on aid every year, much of it badly spent, uh, hasten, I apologise for saying, and yet here is a major prize that we are not trying to reach. We spend probably £40 million in Ukraine, all in, including DFID. We irritate the Russians by parking military kit in the Baltics, and yet the most powerful weapon that we could have against Russian expansion, a stable Ukraine, a Ukraine that looks like Poland and not like Russia, we don't seem to be thinking enough about. And this seems to be, to be an example of a haphazard strategic thinking. So I'd argue that we have an unbalanced foreign policy. DFID burned through money like it's going out of fashion. And I remember my own experience, I mean, I've had lots of pretty miserable experiences with DFID in Afghan and Iraq. I remember asking at the UK consulate in Basra how many DFID projects there were in southern Iraq and how much money would be spent. And I was staggered that they could not provide an answer. And that, for me, has summed up the profligacy and the lack of competence sometimes. I know they do great work in some parts of the world. I have not seen, sadly, the best of it. At the same time, the FCO is chronically underfunded. Defence is scraping together savings, as my right arm friend here says, in areas that they should not be looking at making savings. Cyber attacks are regular in Europe, in France, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, and the BBC, a critical part of our soft power infrastructure, even at arm's length from government, is sort of funded from hand to mouth. The BBC should be funded, the World Service, TV and radio should be funded entirely out of DFID by rejigging and re-looking at the definitions of ODA funding. Looking briefly, I will try to make as much progress as possible. I haven't got too much more to say. Looking closely at defence procurement, can we please have a level playing field? Let's buy kit from other people to save money. But please, those countries that have closed markets like France, why are French companies allowed to bid here when we do not have the same rights to actually get contracts in those countries? And I will be seeking a meeting with the Minister in the nearest future to discuss the need for a complex radar technology demonstrator at the BAE site in Cowes in my constituency. And as the Right Honourable Gentleman I'm sure knows, the BAE factory in Cowes, the radar factory, uh, produces all the radars for the carriers and the Type 45, uh, um, Type 45 destroyers. And if we want our own indigenous radar capability, we need that technology demonstrator soon. Uh, we should use reservists more, uh, and I'm uh, delighted that the right on, uh, the honourable member for Bridge Owen made a, a series of very eloquent points, and I'm a reservist myself. <laughs> we need the reservists, but let's support them. On the Isle of Wight, our own reserve unit was saved, not to, from the wisdom of the MOD, but thanks to the remarkable work of Cap Captain Richard Clark and the continuing leadership of Acting Sergeant Mark Simmons. And I used to be an Acting Sergeant for much of my career in the Army, so I feel a certain uh, um, affinity there. It's individuals who are, uh, who are punching above of their weight to save units from closure. 
It is true also, as the point made by my friend from um, uh, New Forest and, 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 um, and North Wiltshire, there is no redundancy in our system. There are so few surface ships, 17 I think. The reality is, talk to any admiral and they will admit, give them a few drinks or a drink or two, that the carriers are not protectable by the Royal Navy in its current size. And in any conflict or threat of conflict with peer or near peer um, uh, nations, those carriers would go home and sit in a base because they are not protectable unless they would be surrounded by a US fleet and they have no protection against ship-busting ballistic missiles nowadays. If we keep reducing the armed forces in personnel and in kit, we will be encouraging violence against this nation, not deterring it. Some brief suggestions. Can the Foreign Affairs Select Committee champion thinking about strategy, holding hearings to give platforms to leading academics to discuss national strategy and national culture? This is a perfect point in our history to look at our national strategy with Brexit coming up. I think leaving an NSC, the, the security view, to government to provide the answers is that the government is going to come up with the answers that it wants, not the, gov the answers that we all need and want to hear. We do need to rethink DFID funding and in a way to encourage DFID to take a greater responsibility in a more holistic and joined up strategy. And we need to think about defence in the round. Summing up. We need all forms of power for our security and the protection and the projection of our values. Soft power, hard power, cyber power, but most of all we need an attitude of smart power, of integrated power, where we need to study and understand how to project that power at a strategic, at an operational and a tactical level. And from what I have seen, both on operations and here, we still lack that, but it is not unachievable given an ambition from government to do so. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.